about one of the nicest things that happened to me yesterday that indirectly you all were right in the middle of. And I looked up at my, I was at the store at work, and I looked up and I noticed this figure coming in. It looked vaguely familiar, but I had a number of years I had to look between from when I saw him and when I last saw him. And he got two steps in the door, and I got three steps toward him, and it dawned on me. It was my best friend when I was in college at Millsaps in 1966. His name is Lynn Shirley, and Lynn has been a Presbyterian minister since 1974, and one of the finest Christian men I've ever run into. And we sat for about a cup and a half of coffee each and just rehashed. But we got through the old times quick. Have you seen Jack? Have you seen Jill? Have you seen Joe? Have you seen Wah Wah? And we came down to the present. And he did not know that I was part of this family. And I gotta tell you folks, if pride goeth before a fall, I may just fall right over the pulpit here because I am so proud to be a part of you. And as we finish our conversation, he said, you sound terribly happy. And I looked at him and I said, Lynn, I've never been happier in my life. And for that, I owe a whole lot of it to you. And I said, thank you very, very sincerely. How many of y'all remember Al Jolson? A few, okay. How many of you remember a song that he sang and Cassie Klein sang and a number of other people sang called oh, I'm Sitting on Top of the World? I see some hands going up. Good. I whistled it last night for Ann. She didn't recognize it. Now, I don't know what her problem was, but she didn't recognize it. So I decided not to whistle it this morning. But the words go, I'm sitting on top of the world, just rolling along, just rolling along. I'm quitting the blues of the world, just singing a song, just singing a song. Well, you know, that describes sometimes our lives. Sometimes we just are sitting on top of the world. And it's generally, well, it's always pretty much an exciting time in our life. And it might be graduation from high school or from college. It might be that first kiss with that special someone or the first day on a job. Or it might be a wedding. Or it might be the birth of your first child. It might be the culmination of a big, big business transaction that you came out on top. For somebody like Floyd, it might be the first fish he ever caught. You know, and he was in Mark II. He, they were sitting on top of the world. Well, those, we all have had those experiences where, by now that we got the world by the tail, and we're going to shake it. Those are experiences of the world. Let's think about experiences of the heart. Let's think about experiences of our soul. Let's think about spiritual experiences that we've had that may have come from a week at church camp. Or it may have come at a two-day retreat where you gather with folks like-minded seeking the same thing and you have almost an epiphany experience. Or it might have been something small and quiet. It might have been a very intimate conversation that you had with your parents or your children or your siblings or a co-worker or a spouse. But at the end of that conversation, you came away feeling like they heard you, they understood you, and even though they might not agree with you, they respected you, and they loved you. And what do we call these spiritual experiences like that? We call them mountaintop experiences. 
And oh my gracious, whether it's a mountaintop experience in the spiritual world or a sitting on top of the world experience in the secular world, do we really want to come down from there? Heck no, we don't want to come down from there. We want to stay as long as we can. You know, let's just stay here and let the rest of the world go by. But there's a problem with that. Because if we stay there, and if we freeze that moment in time, it shuts off the possibility that that moment might reoccur some other time. Today's scripture about the transfiguration of Jesus is probably the ultimate mountaintop experience. If not, the ultimate is right up there with him. You heard Noah read about Moses and him being on the mountain. And we know that the mountain in the Bible signifies going to be close to God. Hear the word of God from Matthew this morning about Jesus and this mountaintop experience coming from Matthew 17. Six days later, if you read the other stories in Mark and in Luke, you might get a different number there. But six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly <coughs> there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter gets so excited. I love Peter. Peter is so human. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and they were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself all alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This, my friends, is the word of God for the people of God. Right. Thanks be to God. Yes, sir. Mountaintop experiences, and oh my, oh my, we hate to come off of them. And in the gospel today, we get the ultimate, as I said, the mountaintop experience, or one of them, that we call the transfiguration of Jesus. And the transfiguration is one of the top mountaintop experiences, which somehow, and we have them in our lives, but this definitely does, somehow dis defy description. How do you describe Jesus and Moses and Elijah? How did Peter and James and John know who they were? They'd been there hundreds of years before. How did those three dudes know that this is the law, Moses, and this is the prophets, Elijah? But they knew it, didn't they? God was at work in a great and glorious, glorious way. Anyway, it's, it, it, that type of thing defies description in human terms and it challenges us to stretch our concept of reality to the point where we usually wind up asking the question, did that, did that really happen? Did what I just saw really, really happen? Well, for the five people who saw Jesus up there, Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, and John, it really did happen. And this was an important time for Jesus in his ministry because it was a time of confirmation and it was a time of affirmation. And for those three disciples that went up there with him, for Peter and for James and for John, it was just a brief, momentary glimpse of the transcendent 
a peek into reality that lies just beyond what their everyday life was and lies just beyond what our everyday life was. And I go back to use that word confirmation again because it was also an undeniable confirmation that Jesus was who he said he was. God affirmed it. And Peter, James, and John heard it. And good old Peter was just himself. He wanted to stick around. And he wanted to build huts. And he wanted to hang with the big dogs. And Jesus said, no, no, no. And he quickly led Peter and James and John back down off the mountaintop. Jesus led them back, and this is like our mountaintop, our top of the world experiences. Jesus led the three back into the real world. In their case, teaching and preaching and caring for the broken and hurting people of the world they lived in. Jesus led them back into the reality of life. They're in their back. And that brings us to another question. And I think it's a question that at some point in our lives we all ask ourselves, just what is reality? Is that mountaintop experience, that top of the world experience, is that the ultimate reality with its air of celebration? and it's glimpses of glory and what lies behind? Or is reality the messy muddling of everyday life? Is it the promise and is it the hope of salvation where every tear is wiped away? Or is reality, is it the fears and tears we encounter every single day that we live? And then that brings the next question, what is reality in the church universal. But let's bring it home. What is the reality in our group of believers right here that love each other so much? Is reality our prayers and our confessions and our hymns of worship and our hope of heaven that will happen in a sweet by and by and some sweet day? <coughs> or is reality our acts of kindness, our words of encouragement, and the concrete expressions of our faith on just ordinary days, like tomorrow, or Tuesday, or Wednesday. You know, what is reality in the church? John Dean is a religious writer, much, much smarter than I am. And he says that reality, and I really like this, reality is where Jesus and human beings come into contact. Think about that. Jesus and human beings come into contact. But what does that mean? What does reality being the contact of Jesus and humanity mean? You know what I think? And I like this man. I think it means if we're going to use the imagery of Paul that we find in Corinthians, that when we turn to Jesus, when we see through his eyes and see through what he expects of us we, and allow him to be our model, when we allow Jesus to be our guide, we begin to see life just a little more clearly. That veil that prevents us from seeing clearly in our self-contained agendas somehow is moved away. And our vision of reality and what that truly is comes into a sharper focus. Now, don't get overly excited because Paul tells us that we will never see clearly until the final days. There's going to be fuzziness around the edges. But if we really want to get a clear picture of reality of life, we might do well to look at Jesus and through Jesus. Now, I am part of a huge host of preachers over the last 40 years that is so indebted to Fred Craddock. I mean, I don't know what any minister walking would do without Fred Craddock's books and Fred Craddock's illustrations because he's marvelous. He's just marvelous. And he tells a story about a young minister. He just had graduated from seminary 
and he was serving in his very first church. And early one morning, he got a call from a church member that one of his elderly lady members, one who had been in his church